Hi everybody, today's discussion is on enthalpy. What is enthalpy and how does it work and why do we need it? We just had an hour long discussion on Q equals MC delta T and Q equals ML and all sorts of things like that. Do we really need to go further? Well, yeah, unfortunately we do. So um, the best way that I found to uh, describe this is uh, to talk about one of the most uh, iconic situations that has happened in history, which is the explosion of the German blimp or dirigible or whatever, um, the Hindenburg. So 1937 over New Jersey, uh, this blimp was coming in and it caught fire and it exploded. Uh, right in front of everybody. And so the reason that it exploded was because it was filled with hydrogen gas, which is flammable. The hydrogen gas caught fire, and the hydrogen went along with the uh, oxygen that was in the air around there and turned into steam. So let's see if we can't do our Q equals MC delta T here for this, right? Now, let's take this on a much smaller scale and say, all right, you know what, instead of having a giant blimp's worth of hydrogen, let's say that we had four grams. Why four grams? Well, let's keep it simple. I've got two H2, which is four grams. And let's just say that I had a perfectly uh, equal amount of oxygen. I had 32 grams of oxygen. Why 32? That's not equal. Actually, it is. It's the stoichiometric amount of oxygen that you need in order to react with your hydrogen there. So two moles of hydrogen is four grams, one mole of oxygen is 32 grams. And then when that goes together, we're gonna to make 36 grams of water over here. Again, this is all from our stoichiometry unit and really not the point of what is going on here. But let's say that we had a perfect amount of everything, four, 32, 36, that's there. Which one do I use? I have Q equals MC delta T, right? Do I use the four? Do I use the 32? Do I combine them together to make the 36? Um, which specific heat do I use? Because I need a specific heat capacity, right? Do I use a specific heat capacity of the hydrogen? That's listed first. Do I use a specific heat capacity of the oxygen? Well, that's also involved. Do I use a specific heat capacity of the steam? Because we have temperature changing, but it's it's not really... Oh, which... Uh, oh, how do I... Mm, and the answer is you can't. You can't use Q equals MC delta T for any of these processes because we have reached the limits of the values of Q equals MC delta T and Q equals ML because everything that we did in the first section were all physical changes. Now, remind yourself what a physical change is. Physical change is the same stuff so <clears throat> we took solid aluminum and turned it into hotter solid aluminum. That's just a physical change. We took solid water and we melted it and turned it into liquid water. It's still water, though. It's still H2O. So in a physical change, you're talking about the same stuff. All of these are examples of physical changes. And Q equals MC delta T is very good at telling us what are, is going on with physical changes. But it cannot tell us what is going on with any chemical change. And in a chemical change, you end up with new stuff. My hydrogen and my oxygen go together to make water. Well, water is very different than hydrogen and oxygen, which is why the Q equals MC delta T and Q equals ML don't work anymore. So you can't use MC delta T and you can't use ML when you are doing chemical changes. Now, how then are we going to get around the problem? Well, we're going to combine everything that we learned last time, and we're going to introduce a new factor that's going to run an end around this problem so that we can figure out how to work this. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign a new uh, identity, a new thing. And our new thing that you've um, not seen before is the idea of enthalpy, delta H. What is enthalpy? Technically speaking, it's the heat transferred at constant pressure. And if you want to get into it, it involves internal energy and external forces, and it involves uh, isochoric and adiabatic process. Look, we're going to keep it very simple. I'm going to ignore all those other things, and I'm going to put my definition as enthalpy. I'm going to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible, that the enthalpy delta H that's here, this is enthalpy, is the Q, but it's on a per mole basis. So if I write it this way, it's going to be Q 
per mole, right? So it's the heat, it's the Q, but I want it on a per mole basis rather than in a per gram basis. Why moles? Because if I have it in moles, then I can look at something like this and I can figure out, well, if I have a certain number of moles here and I know the heat, I can just kind of use this enthalpy like it was one of my numbers in my balanced equation here and I can figure out the energy that is occurring here. So it turns out that when the uh, Hindenburg here uh, catches fire, right, we've got 484 kilojoules of heat that is being uh, released. Well, how do we know that and how do we, look, okay, first things first. We need to establish some new parameters because while we've already kind of talked about this in our previous um, uh, discussion, uh, we need to really uh, nail down some terms here. So before we go on, let's nail down some uh, terms. And those terms are the following. Endothermic, exothermic, and system and surroundings. Because you can look at every one of these reactions from two perspectives. Maybe you're looking at this from the Hindenburg's perspective. And if you are, then the heat is going out of you, right? <clears throat> you are losing energy. That heat is being released. But maybe you're looking at this from the onlooker's perspective. And if you're one of the onlookers here, well, then you better be careful because that heat is coming at you and you're going to absorb that heat. So are you looking at things in terms of the reaction or what is going on around the reaction? And so let's establish what some of those definitions are. First of all, the first term is system. What is the system? The system is whatever we decide to be interested in. And I know that seems goofy, but it's true. If I am interested in the Hindenburg reaction, if I am interested in this reaction that's taking place here, then I'm going to establish that this is my system. <clears throat> well, then what's going on around it? That's the surroundings. The surroundings is everything else that is not the system. So, this dude here, you're part of the surroundings. The air, everything else going on out here, everything else out here, that's the surroundings. So the system is usually whatever it is that we decide to be interested in, and it's usually the balanced equation that we care about, that we are investigating, that we um, care to, to look into the chemical change that is happening. That's system. Now, We've got two new terms, endothermic and exothermic. So endothermic is when heat is transferred into the system out of the surroundings. And exothermic is when heat is transferred out of the system and into the surroundings. So uh, the great way to think about this is Halloween. So if you are out trick-or-treating for Halloween, well, let's establish what do we care about? Are you the system? Are you the surroundings? Because that's going to make a difference on how you view the event that is occurring. Now, you are a lot closer to this age than I am, but let's say that, that, that we decide that the trick-or-treaters are our system that's here. Well, then that would make the house with all the candy, candy and everything here the surroundings. So what is happening, more than likely, is that the candy is going to go from the house to the trick-or-treaters. So then, if you are the trick-or-treaters and we establish this as our system, then that is going to be an endo-candy or endothermic reaction from the perspective of the system. But from the surroundings, it's going to be an exothermic reaction from the perspective of the house. Now... As a grown-up, I far more relate to the house than I do the trick-or-treaters. So if I establish the house as my system and the trick-or-treaters as my surroundings here, the candy is still going out from the house to the trick-or-treaters, 
But now, if I establish the house as my system, if that's what I decide to care about, then that's going to be an exothermic situation, and then it's going to be an endothermic situation over here for the trick-or-treaters. It hasn't changed the direction of the candy flow. It just changes our perspective on what we care about. Now, that assumes, of course, that there's any change taking place at all. But we all know that there's a bunch of houses every Halloween that uh, don't uh, hand out candy or hand out really awful candy or hand out, you know, apples or, you know, toothbrushes, uh, right, or something like that. And what inevitably happens to those houses is they get TP'd. So <clears throat> those houses that um, hand out the toothbrushes and the dental floss um, deserve the TP. So let's again now look at this from a system surroundings perspective. If you are the teenagers here, that is the system, if that's what you relate to, if that's what you're interested in, and then that makes the tree and the house over here the surroundings, and the TP is going to go from the teenagers over here to the house, then from the teenager's perspective, it's an exothermic situation, but from the household's perspective, it's an endothermic um, situation, right? If, however, you are the homeowner, home, homeowner that uh, handed out the, um, the tooth uh, decay issue, or the tooth uh, the brush and dental floss, and this is what you care about, and this is your system, and these guys over here are your surroundings, the TP is still going from the teenagers to the system over here, but now if this is what you care about, then that's endo and it's exo over here from the surroundings. So regardless of which way you look at a situation, there is always something that is exo and something that is endo. The only thing that matters is what do we care to look into the system and <clears throat> the surroundings the system is what we tend to care about, but oftentimes we have to measure the system by what's taking place in the surroundings. So just a quick reminder here, in an endothermic reaction, you have heat that is leaving the surroundings and going into the system. In an exothermic reaction, you have heat that is leaving the system and going into the surroundings. So again, it all depends on what you establish the system to be, and it can be confusing. So again, here we are. So from the system's perspective, that's typically what we look at. We look at everything, we try to look at everything from the system's perspective, and if we can't look at it from the system's perspective, we look at it from the surroundings perspective and then infer what's happening in the system's perspective, but we almost always want to look at it in terms of the system. And so then, from the system's perspective, if it is endothermic, then we're going to establish delta H to be greater than zero or positive. Again, endo means in, and so it's positive. If we are looking at it from the system's perspective and it's exothermic, well, that means it's out or it's losing, so your delta H should be less than zero or a negative number for the delta H that is there. So, back to our blimp here. Are we looking at it from the blimp's perspective or the person's perspective? Well, since the chemical equation is the blimp, let's look at it from the blimp's perspective. We're gonna look at this in terms of our system. And what did it say? It said that we have 484 kilojoules of heat that is being released. And again, it's being released, it's going out. And so consequently, if it's going out, then our reaction here for the burning of hydrogen is going to be negative 484 kilojoules of heat. Again, negative because it is exothermic here. So the negative sign means it's exothermic. So because it is being released from the system's perspective, we're going to give it a negative sign. So be careful on some of the language that is used in the problems. They are usually trying to imply to you or tell you what is happening in those problems. So I told you that heat was being released from the system's perspective here. So that's why we have a negative delta H that is going on. All right.
A couple of other things to look at when you look at these uh, problems here. So uh, here is an example where I have um, a hydrocarbon and I'm burning it to create carbon dioxide and water. And I am telling you that delta H is negative 5160. So it's exothermic, right? Here's another one. I have a uh, redox reaction going on between aluminum and iron oxide, the thermite reaction here. Please note that it is negative 852. So again, it is an exothermic process because it is negative going on here. So if that's the case, then this 5160 that's here actually shows up on the products side over here. But wait, it's positive here and you have it as negative here. Yes, because the negative that is here is indicating the direction of heat flow. I am telling you that it is being produced by this reaction and is leaving the reaction. And so that amount of heat is ending up on the products side of the equation. Here we are on the products side. I am producing that much heat, which is why that heat ends up on the products side. So this reaction makes 852 kilojoules per mole of the reaction. And so that 852 kilojoules ends up over here on the products side of the equation. So if you ever see heat on the products side, you know it's exothermic and it should be negative when removed from the equation. If it's ever negative when removed from the equation, like it shows here, it's gonna show up in the equation over here as a product, okay? Now, if it's an endothermic reaction, that means the heat is being absorbed by the system. And if that's the case, then what you've got is you've got a positive delta H. Now, if you've got a positive delta H, what you have going on is that the heat is over here on the reactant side. So now I've got the 491 kilojoules for this reaction to occur uh, on per mole of the reaction. That 491 shows up on the left-hand side, on the reactant side over here, right? So endothermic reactions, the heat is on the left-hand side over here. There's your 491 kilojoules. In order to decompose limestone, you need to put in 179 kilojoules per mole. So if you're putting in 179 kilojoules per mole, then you gotta put that 179 over here on the reactants side of the equation, all right? So let's take a look now at some problems. So problem number one says, I'm gonna take one gram of phosphorus trichloride and I'm gonna react it in excess chlorine and I'm gonna get 902 joules of heat that are released. I wanna know what is delta H, okay? What is delta H? Delta H is gonna be equal to the Q per the mole. All right, well, do I have Q of the reaction? I sure do, they gave it to me. They told me what the Q is. So the Q is 902, and that's uh, joules that is there. Now, time out. Be careful, because what did it say? It said 902 joules of heat are what? Released. So that's going to be exothermic. So they are telling you, mathematically speaking, that it should be negative 902, because it is an exothermic situation, and heat is being released. Now, all I need to do is know the moles that actually reacted here. Well, I don't know the moles, but I know the grams. I know that one gram of the phosphorus trichloride reacted. So I get out my calculator and my periodic table, and it's 35 and a half, three times, and another 31 gets me 137 and a half. So this stuff here weighs 137 and a half grams per mole. So if I've got one mole, then uh, one gram, I should say, then that turns out to be, instead of one gram of this, that is 0 0.00727 moles that actually reacted. So I know that I got negative 902 joules for 0 0.00727 moles. So you get out the calculator, 902 at 00727, and I ended up with negative 124,072. That's in joules per mole, 
But at that point, remember, they wanted it in kilojoules per mole because as numbers start to get big, they start to become inconvenient. So we're just going to call that negative 124 kilojoules per mole. So what we've got here is we have Q per mole as our delta H. That's our new big equation that we've got right now. Delta H is equal to Q per mole. Sample number two. I've got 5 grams of magnesium oxide, and I'm putting it in 100 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, and we do that, and so what's going on? All right, so this is how some of this stuff is actually uh, done in the real world. So remember our calorimeter? You're actually going to do this in a lab later, so we're going to go ahead and get ahead uh, on this process. But what we're going to do here is we're going to take a styrofoam calorimeter like we did before, and into that, we're going to go ahead and put in... 100 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, and we said it's 22 degrees Celsius. And into that, we're going to put 5 grams of magnesium oxide that's going to go into there. As soon as that 5 grams of magnesium oxide goes in there, apparently the magnesium oxide and the hydrochloric acid are going to react together, and they're going to give off some heat. How do we know it's giving off heat? Because it says in the problem that if we have a thermometer in there, we started at 22 degrees Celsius according to the problem, but if we read further, it says that the mixture reaches 38 degrees Celsius. So it went from 22 up to 38 degrees Celsius, or in other words, it got hot. Now, this is that system and surroundings kind of a thing. This is what we care about, the magnesium oxide and the hydrochloric acid. But that's not what we measured. What we measured was the water and everything that is in the calorimeter that's going on there. And we are measuring what is happening in the chemical reaction, the system, by what is taking place here in the surroundings in the calorimeter around it. Now, how do we go about doing that? Well, we're going to have to make some assumptions here, and that's okay. <clears throat> because what we're doing is we're going from 22 to 38. Well, that sounds an awful lot like Q equals MC delta T, and it is. Q is equal to MC delta T. This is the Q of the water that is in the calorimeter. All right. Now, here's where some assumptions, and here's where a, um, you know, a few estimations have to uh, take place here. It says in the problem... Assume that the density of the solution is one gram per milliliter. So instead of 100 milliliters, what I've really got is 100 grams. And assume that the specific heat capacity of the hydrochloric acid solution is similar to that of water at 4.18 that is there. So we're going to go ahead and make some assumptions. First of all, my delta T is 16 degrees Celsius because I went from 22 to 38. We're going to assume that it's going to be 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius because that's the specific heat of water. And now our final, final bit of trickeration here. Our final bit of trickeration and what they're going to want you to do on the AP test is they're going to want you to recognize that, yes, you've got 100 grams of the water that is here in our solution that is changing temperature, but you've also put in 5 grams of the magnesium oxide. So that's in there as well. So they're going to want you to include that 5 grams in your calculations. So instead of just calling this 100, we're going to call this 105 grams of total solution that is being mixed and reacted in this guy. And that 105 grams is essentially what is in your surroundings for your solution that's there. So that's the Q of the water. It's going to be 105 at 4.18 at 16. So it absorbed 7,022 joules. But that's not what I want. I don't want Q. I want delta H. So how do I get delta H? Well, remember that delta H is equal to the Q per the mole. Now, next bit of trickeration. The delta H that I want is for the system. And remember, the water is the surroundings 
The system is this equation. The water got hot, and the reason that the water got hot was because I reacted the two of these things together. So the Q of my system is actually going to end up being negative 7022 joules like we saw before. So the system is what we care about, but we're measuring it via the surroundings. Last step in this. All we need to know is moles. So they gave us five grams of magnesium oxide as our limiting reaction of the moles. So the five grams of the magnesium oxide, I got 24.3 grams for the magnesium, um, and I've got uh, 16 grams of the oxygen that is here. So that stuff weighs 40.3. So instead of being five grams, I am at uh, 40.3 grams per mole. So that gets me about 0.124 moles. And so consequently, I'm going to take that 0.124 moles and come down here. 0.124 moles. And I'm going to end up, the, uh, end up with then 70.22 divided by 0.124 which is uh, 56,600 uh, joules, or it's going to be, so it's negative 56,629 joules per mole, or it's going to end up being, um, whoopsie, joules per mole, or it's going to end up being negative 56.6. In sample problem number three here, what do we have going on? Well, this is just going to be a stoichiometry problem, and the stoichiometry problem that is involved here is going to involve uh, heat. So what I'd like to make sure that you do is just recognize that this number here is on a per mole basis, and so consequently you can just kind of treat it as if it were the moles that were in a particular problem. So if this is negative 92 over here and it's kilojoules uh, per mole, then that means that what you end up with is because it's negative, it's on the product side. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put 92 heat over here. That's the way my brain thinks about it. I'm just gonna put 92 heat as if it were one of these numbers that were in front. So what's it say? It says that we're gonna take 40 grams of hydrogen. Remember, this is our real world unit that's here, right? And then we're gonna come down here to mole world, just like we did before, and we're gonna go over and we're gonna go over like we did before and then <clears throat> that number there is kind of like our mole number and we're done so i've got 40 grams of um, hydrogen and hydrogen weighs uh, two grams per mole and so 40 grams at two grams per mole is 20 moles and then all i'm going to do is take my 92 and my three that's here and just like we did in the other stoichiometry, I'm going to multiply that by 92 thirds, and I am done. So this is 20 at 92 thirds gets me about 613. I'm going to get 613 kilojoules of heat that's on the product side, so that's heat that is released in the process. So if you have a stoichiometry problem like this, just take the heat that is given to you here and just put it in as if it was a um, stoichiometric function in your equation. I'm sure there are other ways uh, to do this. That's the way my brain thinks about it. If you don't like that, then we can talk about other ways some other time. All right. All right, next. Uh, sample four says, uh, what's going on with this guy? Well, a student sets up an alcohol burner underneath a beaker of water containing 300 grams. If the reaction proceeds as the equation below and no heat is lost, then how many grams of ethanol must be burned to raise the water? Oh boy, that's a lot going on here. All right, fine. So uh, a couple things. Uh, I've got negative 1370 kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in over here as plus 1370 uh, heat, 1370 heat in my equation so that I don't get confused, All right? So 1370 heat that is there. Now, here's what's um, conceptually speaking uh, happening here. It says that we're gonna take a beaker of water and it says, by the way, 
uh, we have uh, 300 grams of water at 22 degrees Celsius. So I have 300 grams of water, and it's at 22 degrees Celsius. And then it says we're going to set up a burner underneath, and that burner contains our alcohol. And we're going to light that alcohol burner on fire. And all the heat is going to go directly into this, and we're not going to lose any heat to the surroundings. Haha, <laughs> sure. But fine. <sighs> Frictionless planes, like in physics. We're going to take all of that heat, and we're going to put it directly into there. And it says, how much heat are we going to need to burn? How much alcohol are we going to have to burn to create enough heat so that we can take this 22 degrees Celsius that is here and raise it, it said, to its boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius. doesn't say we have to boil it. It says the only thing that we have to do is raise the water to its boiling point. We just have to get it up there. We don't have to boil it. So from our phase diagram perspective, if we are looking at this from up, over, up, over, and up, we are just being asked to go from 22 up to 100 and stop. So it's only a one-step problem here. We're just going from there. So we, we can do this. Q is equal to MC delta T. So again, I didn't say Q is useless. I just said that the Q was only good for physical changes. Well, that's what's occurring here. We are doing a physical change. We are heating water, <coughs> but we are heating it by a chemical change. But the heat that we are absorbing here in our physical change is going to tell us about what's going on in our chemical change that's here. So the Q for the water is going to be equal to MC delta T. So the Q then is going to be equal to, what was it, 300 grams, I want to say? Yep. And we know water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And we are going to change by 78 degrees Celsius from 22 up to 100. That's 78 degrees Celsius. So consequently, I need 300 at 4.18 at 78. That gets me 97,812 joules. Or if we want to put it in terms of kilojoules, I need about 97.8 kilojoules for that to occur. All right. So, we're going to come back up here. Remember this guy? So this guy up here, what I want to know, I want to know grams of ethanol. So I want to know grams here. Well, how do I get to grams there? Well, I'm going to have to know the moles of this stuff, right? But I don't know the moles of that stuff. But I know that I need... What was it? 97.8 kilojoules. I know that I need 97.8 heat over here for this guy. Well, how do I get from here over to there? Well, it's going to be 1 for every 1370 that I have here of my heat. So if I take my 97.8, uh, 97.8, and I divide it by my 1370 that's here, then I'm going to get 0.07 moles, 1, 4, 0.0714 moles of my ethanol that I need to burn in order to get that guy to go, assuming no heat is lost to the environment. Now all i got to do is get from moles to grams. So that stuff weighs, uh, what is it, uh, 46 probably, 24 and 6 and 16, yeah, 46. So this stuff weighs 46 grams per mole, and so consequently, 46 at .0714 gets me about 3.28 grams. 3.28 grams. So if I were to burn 3.28 grams... I would get 0.0714 moles of alcohol. And because, again, remember they told us up here that I get 1,370 kilojoules for one mole of alcohol being burned, then I'm going to get 97.8 kilojoules out of it if I have 0.074 moles. And the 97.8 is what I need to do this step here. 
So we're kind of combinifying all of our logic, our thermodynamics logic and our stoichiometric math logic all into one in 